Welcome back to April Space 13.23 against the rain part 4. We are back. Welcome. Welcome back. Guys, what is the Aetheral Space equivalent of Shogun? What's their big TV show? Um, uh, Supreme. Supreme? Yeah. What's it about? Is it like a documentary series? It's be a dramatization of the first Supreme. <laughs> Contender. <laughs> Follows Loro in his journey. Oh, man. Okay. <clears throat> The body of Hachiman creaked and clicked in the darkness, its hollow grin shining as it seemed to regard Muzazi. Those long, skeletal fingers seemed to dance through the air as it pondered which weapon to use before finally settling, I assume on, the massive bow clutched in two of its four hands. In an instant that felt agonizingly long, it took an arrow from between its ribs and drew back the string. Muzazi's heart hammered in his own chest as he saw that arrow pointed at him. What was this? What was the category of this thing again? It was like one of the three guardian entities that something. Well, it's like the the top tier ones. Uh, the, the S tier yeah. guardian. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was coming. <clears throat> it was coming. Some animal instinct deep inside his body told him that this would be the most dangerous attack yet. He had to dodge it. If he couldn't dodge it, he had to block it. Sweat poured down his body as he waited for the fatal moment. The moment Hachiman would commit to the attack and Muzazi could respond. It came. Hachiman released the string, pain, and the arrow vanished. Muzazi's pupil shuddered as he grasped for understanding of what had just happened. The arrow had not gone flying out of the bow. He was certain of that. It wasn't an illusion of speed that had made the arrow disappear. It had literally vanished. Vanished to where, though? Muzazi already suspected that. Slowly, blood already dribbling from the side of his mouth, he looked down. The tip of the arrow was protruding from his chest, of course. Despite everything, as he fell to one knee, he couldn't help but smile bitterly. He'd been shot in the back, of course! It seemed even an enemy standing in front of him was capable of such a feat. He gasped out the words, Oh, did you? As Hachiman had taken over combat for the time being, Nil Manrin had taken the opportunity to recover his strength. He stood up straight as he looked down at Muzazi, his eyes cold. The mocking smirk he had worn previously had vanished. When it came to the killing blow, this man abandoned emotion. Hachiman, he said by way of explanation, some people have started calling this guy the god of murder thanks to me. Its ability is to launch unblockable and unavoidable attacks. Oh, it's a domain expansion? <laughs> <laughs> Essentially? That goes kind of hard. Muzazi's eyes widened and his jaw nearly fell agape. That couldn't be right, could it? Such an ability would be absurd. This had to be another bluff from the King of Killers. Only... His eyes seemed honest right now. Would you like a second demonstration? Nail asked. Hachiman raised up its sword. Immediately, Muzazi ignored Radiant to defend. He poured nearly all his aether into his hands, ready to parry with all his might. The effort was fruitless. As Hachiman brought the wooden sword down, the space between the blade and Muzazi's body seemed to contract and compress, as if the whole world had be become a distorted lens, just for a moment. In that instant, the sword that had been meters away now directly slashed Muzazi's chest and cut viciously, spraying blood onto the ground. Before he could even feel the pain, space snapped back to coherency, restoring the distance between Muzazi and the Guardian entity. You see, Nail continued as Muzazi collapsed to the ground. It doesn't matter what you try and block with or how far you run away. Hachiman manipulates space itself to reach you. Every arrow it fires is a point-blank shot. Every swing of its sword is right in your face. As for the spear... Why didn't you just use this from the beginning? Hmm. He raised a hand, and Hachiman tossed him the wooden pole arm. Nail spun it in his grip, a cold smile returning to his lips. Well, he said, you won't need to see that one today. So all caps is good, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, that's like the high tier respect. Ioneer Yggdrasil slapped an enemy out of the air with a mighty branch arm, reducing them to a smear on the wall. The familiar they'd summoned, a bizarre creature like a flayed kangaroo, vanished with them. They hadn't even gotten the chance to use their ability. As expected, those working for Nailmindrin had cut. Oh, that's like the worst one, right? <laughs> no, the worst one is lowercase and space. Lowercase and space? Yeah. So when it's normal capitalization, but no space, that's the average. That's neutral, yeah. Okay. As expected, those working for Nail Minrin had come to try and assist him in this battle. A toy Muzazi had been prudent to post cards. Ioneer Yggdrasil, Morgan Noct, and Marcus Grace fought with vigor to keep any of these assassins from breaching the constructed dome. 
The young man slashed a metallic owl clean in half, and the cogitant fired three perfect shots to shatter a shield of carbon. Like Ioneer Yggdrasil, they would not contone interference. This victory belonged to Atoy Muzazi alone. Even so, things were not going well for Atoy Muzazi inside the dome. While Ioneer Yggdrasil was controlling a humanoid body like this, it lost much access to the senses from its other forms, but the scent and taste of Atoy Muzazi's blood was familiar. It littered the floor of the battlefield. More than anything else, Ioneer Yggdrasil wished to break its promise and assist Atoy Muzazi in this fight. But even if it wasn't bound by promises, some things still were just not done. Nail and Hachiman swooped in from either side, catching Muzazi in a pincer attack between them. Muzazi weaved and dodged as Nail swung and stabbed with the wooden spear, all the while keeping track of the guardian entity looming menacingly behind him. Why wasn't it attacking? Nail was clearly running interference for his guardian entity, but that didn't make sense. If the attacks Hachiman unleashed truly were unblockable and undodgeable, then there would be no need to make sure Muzazi was distracted. Even if he was distracted, what could he do? No. Behavior like this meant there was a weakness being compensated for. It wasn't the only oddity. For one, why wasn't he dead yet? It would have been easy for that unavoidable arrow to pierce his brain rather than his back. Even his heart had been missed. I, I have a theory. Yeah. It can only launch attacks that would have hit regardless. That's I'm locking that in. So, like, for example, he's too guarded to get headshot, but not for a back shot. Oh. Wait, what? <laughs> Same oh, with what? the chest <laughs> line. Yeah, Muzazi loves taking back shots. You wrote it in. That was your story <laughs> that you told me. Well, that means Regan's signature move is back shots. Giving back shots, yeah. <laughs> Even as hard as been <laughs> I alone give back shots. The second slash had failed to finish him off, too. Why? The arrow was still protruding from Muzazi's chest, each movement bringing forth burning pain, but he didn't dare remove it. It's true, you're actually not supposed to do that. As things stood, it was the only thing stopping him from bleeding out. He ducked under a winding branch near the border of the fine. Of the fire and into it. Sorry. Of, what the fuck? Sorry. <laughs> he ducked under a white. How did you get. Hmm. Hike me shotgun. Okay, so he look at your a... keyboard. Look where F is next to D. Look where I okay. is next to O. <laughs> so you missed the entire word except for E. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he did. <laughs> he ducked. <laughs> Missing all your inputs in the quick time event. <laughs> He ducked under a winding branch near the border of the dome and into an underbrush below, small enough to house Nail and Muzazi, but not Hachiman. Right now, he needed to probe for weaknesses. How did Hachiman acquire the target for its unavoidable attacks? Did it have to see the enemy? Was there a general range they had to be within? If it was the latter, that would be bad news indeed, given the cramped battlefield. But if it was the former, he may still have a chance. As Muzazi fell backwards into the undergrowth, he saw Hachiman suddenly freeze in the air and raise the sword once more. The next second, the Reaper was no longer visible, concealed behind countless branches and trunks. Excuse <sighs> me. No problem. Muzazi wasn't relaxed, per se. He was still dodging for his life against Nail's spear. But he allowed himself to hope for a moment. Then he was struck by Hachiman's second sword strike. This time, it struck him in the back again, near his hip. Muzazi gasped in pain, but that was quickly cut short as Nail, taking advantage of the distraction, slammed the butt of his spear into Muzazi's face. There was a sickening crunch as Muzazi was sent crashing through the branches back into the open, his nose gruesomely broken. He had no time to recover. As Muzazi flew out, Hachiman appeared in his path, raising its sword to cut him down mid-flight. They're jumping him. Uh, they are. On instinct, Muzazi used his thrusters to flip into a ready position and this time blocked that sword strike with his own radiant. His eyes widened. Huh? Nail caught up, slamming his foot into Muzazi's side and sending him crashing down to the floor. Even as he slid across the ground, though, leaving a slick trail of blood as he went, Muzazi's mind was racing. He'd just seen something important. That last one had been an ordinary attack. It had been strong, sure, but not unavoidable. Why hadn't Hachiman used its ability there? As Muzazi there... As Muzazi threw himself off... off yeah. I assume threw himself up off the ground, dodging a spear strike aimed at his head from Nail, an answer swam into focus. Between Hachiman's first and second attacks, there had been several seconds of time, but the third attack had taken place almost immediately after the second. Was it that simple? Was there a charging time to those unavoidable strikes? Slowly but surely, he was investigating this ability. No power was absolute. Conditions existed for every glory. Tell that to the Supreme. Hmm? Yeah, there were conditions. <laughs> It did not really, though. <laughs> <laughs> he was just strong enough that he didn't have to be very tight bound conditions. The sword swung through empty air for a third time, and Muzan. Also, we never really learned uh, Ein Sof's condition. It was just like invincible. Wasn't oh, well, it was it? basically hardbot shotgun for, for every like force, but just for force in general. 
Damn. So if there was no stimulus, it would not be very strong, but of course there is. <laughs> uh, the sword swung through empty air for a third time, and Muzazi tensed up, ready to receive the blow. White-hot pain pulsed next to his head, and sickly blood began to crawl down his chin. A single glance to what had just fallen told Muzazi all he needed to know. This time, his right ear had been cut off. No! <laughs> you can't take much more face damage. You've already lost half his face. What the fuck, Dan? He's going Next you're going to make him bald. My goodness. Well, there, was an... there was another matter he needed to clarify. What determined when where Hachiman's attacks hit? There seemed to be little rhyme or reason to them, but Muzazi doubted they were truly random. Nail and Hachiman attacked at the same time. The spear stabbed deep into Muzazi's right arm, nearly impaling the limb, and the King of Killers used the resultant leverage to hurl Muzazi up into the air. As he flew, Hachiman fired off another arrow at him, not an unavoidable one, but still opens... But still... One so strong and so fast that it took all he had left to dodge it. It blasted a hole in the wooden dome, city light and battle cries oozing in through the gap. He didn't have long. He had to figure this out now! As Muzazi landed, focusing nearly all his aether into his legs to keep himself steady, Hachiman raised its blade once more. And with that, the full moon understood. Popcorn. This was all but over. Nil watched grimly as Muzazi fell out the air, ready to receive Hachiman's absolute arrow. He was the first to stay alive against the god of murder for so long, but in a way that was even worse. The injuries he was accruing had long since robbed him of the ability to move under his own power. He was using thrusters for all of that now. By the time he finally dropped, it would have to be a closed casket funeral. Or a closed casket night, I perhaps. Oh, that's a throwback to, um... Arc 3. Uh, arc th yeah, Arc 3. Why does he know about a Nyang? Um, he's been around the last few years. What was what was the specialty of a Nyang funeral a again? A Nyang is like a funeral, but you're happy they're dead. Oh. <laughs> that's right, it's like a party. Yeah. Can we have a Nyang for the Queen? But Margaret Thatcher would have had a Nyang. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's so funny. Continue. Actually, man, Nail muttered. Finish him off. The arrow vanished from the string, and Neil waited for the man before him to drop dead like so many others. Only, he didn't. He remained there, legs quivering beneath him, a black and white hair hanging over his face. Had he died on his feet? No. Even as he looked up, Neil furrowed his brow. What? The full moon was grinning, almost giggling, even as his own blood dripped from his face. Slowly, he raised his left hand, extending a middle finger. Or at least he would have, if, if that finger wasn't now missing from the hand. The stump spat, sp spat blood all over. I knew it! it as he gasped, delirious from blood loss. That thing's attacks can't be dodged, and they can't be blocked, but they can be mitigated. Shit, he'd figured it out. It as he threw himself forward with thrusters, that mad grin still on his face, a rage igniting from the palm of his other hand. Your Hachiman has three weaknesses, he screamed, and he as he did, he swung his blade and attempted decapitation that Nail only narrowly avoided. He's lost his mind. One! was as he roared. Hachiman and Nail lunged at him at the same time, but the full moon blocked both of twin radiants from his palms. Your guardian entity can't unleash those unavoidable attacks continuously, right? There's a charge time of five seconds! Hachiman broke Ooh. free of their blade clash, seizing Muzazi by the head and hurling him toward the other side of the dome. As Muzazi flew, Hachiman and Nail swapped weapons, Nail tossing the spear back to its owner and catching the bow in his own hands. The god of murder thrust the spear forward, space crushed between itself and Muzazi for just an in instant to accommodate the killing blow. But another of um, killing blow, but another of Muzazi's remaining fingers burst into gore instead. Do! Muzazi cried, twisting in the air. He pressed his feet against the side of the dome as he made contact and kicked back off, zooming like a bullet towards Nail and Hatchman. Those attacks, they can't be dodged, they can't be blocked, but they can be mitigated. Nail clicked his tongue as he threw the bow up, blocking a radiant strike intended to slice him in half. This bastard really had figured it out. It was true. There was no way to dodge or block Hatchman's ability. No matter at what, the attack would hit the target. However, whether the attack would kill the target was another story entirely. Hatchman took the path of least resistance. <gasps> The attack would strike the part of the target's body that was the least effective. Yo! Yo! <laughs> I said that, right? Uh, yeah, he basically said that. Yes! Even if they covered their entire body in absurd armor, some spot would be slightly less durable than the rest, and that was where the blow would land. Because as he was taking advantage of that to buy himself time. 
At the very instant Hatchman unleashed its absolute attack, Muzazu rele was releasing the infusion on one of his fingers so that it would take the attack rather than the vital spot. Nail supposed Muzazu didn't need fingers to swing those light swords of his, but still, what a crazy bastard. It wouldn't save him. As Muzazu pushed against Nail, trying to overpower him with what he had left, Hatchman loomed over the full moon from behind. Five seconds had passed. Free! Muzazu gasped. Whenever Hatchman uses an absolute attack, it has to stop all other movement. But just because five seconds had passed didn't mean Hatchman had to use an absolute attack. Muzazu kicked Nail and spun around, swinging his radiance at the immobilised Hatchman. Only, it wasn't immobilised. With languid ease, Hatchman swooped out the way of Muzazu's strike and lunged in, thrusting the spear forward. Before the full moon could blink, he'd been impaled on the weapon, held upon high by the guardian entity. The tip of the spear bloomed forth from just under, underneath Muzazi's collar. He tried to take a breath, but all he managed was a dry gasp. Nail stood up straight, brushing some of the blood and dust from his coat. And that's game, he growled. Popcorn. <gasps> oh. So, Muzazi thought, his mind is shadow. This is the world as you see it, Nail Manrin. I see. I see what you mean. This truly is intolerable. An endless sequence of blows, unavoidable, always aimed for the part of you most vulnerable. No matter how far you ran, or how hard you tried to defend yourself, new pain would find you. Any happiness was just the world bluffing. Any peace was just the instant between attacks. There was no hope. There was nothing. But was that really true? Muzazi reached up, seized the spear that had run him through with what fingers he had left, and grinned his bloody grin once more. The moment Hachiman had impaled him, Nail had lost this battle. It must be humiliating for the King of Killers, Muzazi supposed. He'd been fooled. Exactly the same way, twice in one night. White specks of light flowed into Muzazi's shaking hands. In these cramped quarters, there would have been no way for Muzazi to charge up Radiant Almighty. Nail or Hachiman would have destroyed the pillars instantly. But the Guardian entity really shouldn't have fired off that arrow. It really shouldn't have opened that hole in the dome. Because right now... Six massive blades of light were blazing on the outside of the structure. Nail realized too late. His eyes widened and he jumped back. He opened his mouth and screamed, Hachiman! Get him away! Hachiman followed the command it was given. He dropped the spear and Musazi with it, leaving them to fall out of the air. But still, too late, too late, too late! As Musazi turned to mid-fall, he saw Hachiman's inhuman face and smiled. It was an ugly, wretched thing, all bone and blood and snarling tongue. All it could do was kill. All it could do was hurt. There is more to life than you, Muzazi thought, looking at the god of murder. A toy, Marie said. I love you too, Marie. A toy, Muzazi swung the sword up. Radiant, almighty, and everything went white. Look at that. Aww, his heart's so full of love in this moment. <laughs> love wins, Nail. Get owned. I am not a Duba. <laughs> Nail trying to explode Muzazi with his incel rage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good! Oh, gamers. What a what a chapter. Anyway, <clears throat> we have some eighth roll questions now. Yes, we do. Quite a few of them. I don't know where we left off. Let me give me a second. Uh okay. Uh Lan asks, why don't more Aether users incorporate Neverwire into their moveset? Because it's tricky, because if you touch it, your Aether will also be disrupted. But couldn't you just have, like, a handle and then Neverwire at the end, and then you press a button that lights up the Neverwire, and then you stab him with yeah, it? It's possible, but it's, it opens the possibility of being used against you as well. True. Wiser, uh... Okay. No, hang on. That wasn't the question. Where was it? Um... Uh... 
Uh, Wiser and I kind of answered this. I didn't know if you agreed with our answer, but Lan also asked, when it comes to war, wouldn't it be more efficient to just send, like, the Giga Aether user at any given space rather than, like... Oh, no, no, here it is. Here, here was the question. What does war look like in the AS universe? Would the Supremacy primarily use Aether users, automatics, or normal soldiers with weapons? What about the UAP? Well, mostly you'd have sort of normal armies, because Aether users are not the majority of the armed forces, obviously. There are Aether users in the Supremacy military and UAP military that aren't, like, special officers or nebulas or anything. They're sort of just, like, top, higher tier, well, higher tier in terms of the nebulas and just, like, a different division in terms of special officers. Right. special officers are much, I... much, very much more in terms of power. That's what we figured is, like, the vast majority of stuff was, like, boots on the ground military, and then Aether users were, like, for the big decisive battles. Yeah. Because, like, the galaxy's a big place, and you said yourself there's only, like, what, a thousand special officers? Uh, yeah, it's just special officers, but special officers equals slash equals Aether users. Yeah. Because, like, um, for example, Gregory has it. He used to be a special officer at one point, but then he was just part of the military in general, under total. Mm-hmm. So he was not a special uh, officer, but he was still like an AFU user in that hierarchy. Correct. We have more questions, but I'll save them for the next chapter. Alright, um, thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye! Bye.